Welcome to Transformations, Interviewing People, Changing Our World. I'm your host, Diane J. Shaver, and as you've noticed, the people I interview are very different from one another, but what they have in common is a passion. They made a decision and a commitment to do something to make this a better world. And my wish for you is that they inspire you to find what's in your heart that you can contribute. And so one day I'll be interviewing you as you make this a better, more just, equitable, healthy world for all. So we've all been aware of all the discussions about climate change, and there's so much in the news about it. And we're hearing how the polar ice caps are melting at alarming rates. Water in many states is unsafe. Sea levels are rising. Our air has more carbon in it than it's had in 12 million years. That's pretty impressive and not in a good way. Um, and when I talk with people about this, they're very overwhelmed. And I feel that too. It feels like there's nothing we can do. However, there is a gentleman named Marshall Saunders who decided to take action. Realizing that it's going to take a lot of us working together he created something called the Citizens Climate Lobby. And though his background was in real estate brokerage specializing in shopping center development and leasing, he created this wonderful thing. And it's going to really give you hope. It did for me. So I'm going to let him tell you about his journey and why he does what he does and what he sees happening as a result. So welcome, Marshall. We're delighted to have you on Transformations. Thank you very much, Diane. Um, it's an honor for me to be here. I've been excited about it, been thinking about it every morning when I sit in my favorite chair. <laughs> oh, and this is your favorite chair that you're in right now? Well, actually, this is at the office. Favorite chair is at home by the back door. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Well, it's the best we can do. What can we say? But anyway, what was the defining moment for you when you decided to create the Citizens Climate Lobby? What went through your mind? What touched you? And did you see it a lob as a lobby at first, or how did how did it evolve for you? Uh, uh, thank you. Um, well, I had been uh, lobbying with an organization called Results, and we had I had lobbied with them for about twelve years. We had asked the the Congress. Uh, the government for more and better funding for AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, basic education, and uh, micro credit. So I, n I had a background of uh, lobbying, uh, lobbying the Congress and, and the media. So that was kind of it. Um, and tell our listeners how a lobby works in case they don't know. And I just didn't really think about it before, but I. Just enlighten us, please. <laughs> well, we uh, meet with our members of Congress, both in the, in the district, in the House, and in the state, in the Senate. And, uh, and we know that the members of Congress, House and Senate, have to have support. So we lobby the media as well. And, um, and so uh, once a year, or tw really twice a year, we go to Washington, D.C. Uh, 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 we bring about 1,500 people there, lobby our members of Congress. We uh, will meet with uh, uh, about 500 plus uh, out of the 535 members there. So it's just me meeting and talking and doing it in a respectful, um, very polite, um, non-judgmental way. So that's what I, that's what I mean by lobbying and, and a little bit about the way we go about it. Then I've, I've just joined your Charleston chapter. So talk to us about the chapters all over and what they do and how they support what your efforts are. Okay. Okay. Well, we have, uh, I don't know, about 530, maybe 500 to 550 chapters. It's always changing a little bit. So um, I don't know exactly. Um, we, uh, we, uh, I, I meet with the San Diego chapter, South San Diego chapter, once a month. And um, so it's about like, it's about like that. 
Okay. And what do you do when you meet? What do you what do you talk about? What are the goals? What what is it accomplished? Well, um, the goal, of course, is um, to have a friendship uh, with our member of Congress and to persuade him or her uh, to support the uh, uh, well very specific legislation. We have been working uh, for. 10 years to uh, introduce uh, uh, a, uh, an, an idea uh, called carbon fee and dividend. And, um, and to, to been uh, tr uh, introducing that. And then at the end of the last Congress, uh, it finally got introduced. And then uh, at the beginning of this Congress, we have uh, gotten some members to introduce it again <clears throat> and i think we have about 40 co-sponsors on the legislation right now wow so, so you see um it's it's so hard sometimes just sitting here and knowing what we all know and then watching what happens in congress do you feel like there really is impact do you feel like um members of Congress, some of them are really understanding and, and wanting to implement what you suggest? Well, <clears throat> yes, I, <laughs> obviously I do. Um, let me just think. I think um, the members of Congress um, want good legislation. I think that uh, the vast majority of them understand what's going on with with climate change and uh, they know it's very serious uh, and yet they uh, they're afraid. I think they, well, they're afraid of the electorate, afraid that the electorate uh, won't uh, doesn't want to hear about it. So Really, uh, we are by lobbying the media. We're we're uh, we're uh, also educating the public. Now, I think the media has come a long, long way since we first started uh, calling on them. Yeah, because you do hear them talking about it. Um, yeah, yeah, you do. And the thing that fascinates me, and not in a good way, how the oil and coal industry. Um, are seeming to ignore this. I mean, they live on the same planet. It doesn't matter whether we acknowledge it or not, we're all gonna suffer the consequences of what's going on. What do you think is going on with these people in, in your experience or your thoughts about it? <laughs> yes, it's very puzzling. It is. Yeah. They're living, they're breathing the same air we breathe. You can't get away from it. And here's my fantasy. My fantasy is they think that we're gonna get um, a colony on Mars, so when it gets bad here, they can escape to Mars. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I really think that is going on. <laughs> well, that, Diane, I, in the uh, 80s, uh, a book came out called The Road Less Traveled. Did you oh, yeah. happen to read that? Of course, yeah. And just about everybody did, and it was on the New York Times bestseller list for about, I don't know, 10 or 12 years, like there had never been anything like it and it was a dissection of uh of human nature yeah. what what we do and what we think and uh and uh, there were particularly three disciplines that uh, early in the book one was uh uh, uh the furl of gratification so uh, human beings don't want to do that we we want to do the easiest part first and uh we want to avoid the hard part and uh and not make a sacrifice that's just kind of human nature and then another one is kind of a re refusal to accept responsibility and then what was the third one is um responsibility is uh, to just taking responsibility for it yeah. for what's going on whether you cause it or not yeah. so um that that book was very influential uh, in me. Uh, ex how can I say accepting going to see that movie, The Inconvenient Truth, oh. and uh, then 
saying, my God, that can't be true. And, and then going to see it again. And then, a, and then a third time. And, um, and, uh, and then, uh, at, at that point, I didn't, I knew there was a huge problem. Yeah. And, um, I hadn't really known that before. And, um, and, but I didn't know what to do. So I'm mean, it's like you were yeah. saying earlier on, I, you know, it's like we have this huge problem now. What are we going to do about it? Well, that's when I, uh, remembered, uh, and, and, and began thinking about my background of lobbying the Congress and the media on these diseases of the poor. And I thought, well, would that work with climate change? I don't know. And uh, it kind of in, in retrospect, uh, it, it seems kind of obvious that it, that it should work and would work and, and will. Uh, but at the time, I didn't, I didn't really know, and I wondered. I saw in the weekly magazine that uh, Al Gore was going to train a thousand people to give that slideshow. Mm. And I raised my hand and they, lo and behold, they chose me and I went back there to Nashville, got trained in the slideshow and came home and uh, Diane, I, when I give a talk, it's, not, it's unlike an interview. When I give a straight old talk, uh, I practice and practice and practice. And which I did with the inconvenient truth. And uh, so let's just see. Uh, and I gave, I gave uh, I like 40, 50 talks, 40, 50 talks. And um, so let's just see uh, where I'm going here. And I gave all these talks. And uh, when I was about halfway through, and uh, in uh, 2007, I, I came in, went out, went out and got the newspaper. I brought the newspaper and sat down at the kitchen counter. And, uh, and I read in the paper that the Congress had given, the day before, the day before, given $18 billion to the fossil fuel industry. And I thought, I've gotten about 18 people to change their light bulbs. And I thought, this is just never going to work. And that's when I first began to think that what we need was a, uh, a national lobby with thousands of people organized, all saying the same thing and asking for effective legislation and of course everybody was saying oh the kind of legislation you're proposing will never work i mean it'll work but it'll never pass so that's how i got that's how i got started with it yeah it's it's kind of horrible to think about but the thing that that strikes me and that people aren't picking up on all of this new um technology that comes out of not using fossil fuels is going to create huge companies, huge numbers of jobs for people. Why aren't people, in your opinion, why aren't people getting that? I mean, this is a whole <laughs> new industry that's going to rise up. Yeah, I, I don't know. There is a stubbornness about human nature. There is a, there is a desire to avoid, uh, as I was saying earlier, avoid reality and uh, and uh, maintain the status quo and uh, just don't do anything there's a there's a scott peck talked about this uh, ultimate laziness personal laziness that we all deal with and then and then of course it's societal too do you think so, it's laziness or do you think it's fear i often think it's just fear absolutely fear absolutely fear and uh but you know, Peck said, fear is a form of laziness. Hmm. <laughs> yes and no. I, I, I kind of need to chew on that one a little yeah. bit. Yeah, of course you do. It's, uh, it's, I, you, you know, it's like I've never heard it anywhere else, but yeah. I've been thinking about it all these years, like about 20, 25 years. Wow. 
So look at all these young kids that are coming. Look at Greta Thunberg in Sweden and um, the climate law, not climate lobby, what do they call themselves? Climate changers. And there's a whole bunch of young people who are coming up. How do you, how can we help them? And do you see them as having an effect? I was thinking about all the young people who are getting it and who are alarmed and are taking responsibility, are stepping up, like Greta Thunberg in Sweden, and then um, the different climate um, groups that are just young kids. One of them was like nine years old and the, and the oldest is like 16, but yeah. they're, they're starting to step up. Do you think they will have impact and how can we help them? Well, it, uh, it lies in the Congress. Yeah. We, you know, uh, we absolutely, as a, as a global society, have to stop putting the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Yeah. We can develop all these uh, alternatives. Uh, but if we don't stop, if we don't plug the hole in the boat, which is uh, more and more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, right. nothing is going to matter. Yeah. And they're like the auto industry of all industries is really stepping up. Like VW has an electric bus that they're going to release, um, Tesla, of course. Uh, and Ford talked about making their F-150 truck, the, the truck, um, electric. So, I mean, there are pockets of industries that are getting this. And I, I hear what you're saying about Congress. And I sometimes, I, fortunately, we just got um, Joe Cunningham into Congress. And he understands all of this. He's, he's an ocean engineer. And he's doing all of this really good stuff. So that's one person. But the changes come from the bottom up. And I was around for the Vietnam War and I lived in Cambridge, Mass, um, near Harvard Square. And that was like a hotbed there. But people started rallying and showing up and complaining and um, not going away. And it did help in the war. And I think that it needs to come all the way from the bottom up. I think people protesting, and peaceful protest, obviously, um, and, and talking about it, because I think that's the only thing that puts pressure on Congress. I mean, because these kids are growing up, like, like the kids from Parkland, they're now able to vote, and you can better believe how they're going to vote. So I, I think that, not to um, take away from what you're saying, because I, I feel <laughs> exactly what you're talking about, but, I mean, these kids are going to make a change, and um, there are huge numbers of them. There's more, there's more of them than there are of us in terms of yeah. your number. So, you know, I think that's the other thing. We, we need to look at the grassroots thing, because that's the only way. Change never comes from the top down, ever, 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 ever. Um, and I mean, look at all the revolutions that have gone on all around the world. And I'm not suggesting we have a revolution by any matter of means, but it is people standing up, people wanting. And I talk to a lot of people who um, really care about this. And I'm part of uh, Unity Church in, in Charleston has an Echo newsletter and I write in it as well. And we have a thousand subscribers, and that's not a lot of people, but they are reading it. So uh, it's like, I think it, and that's why I like the chapters of the climate change lobby, because it's, it's getting people to be aware and, and to know that they have power. And I think the crux of the situation is people do not understand they have personal power. They see power in wealth, they, they see power in elected officials. That's not real power. I mean, you can be an elected official, you can be the richest person on the planet and not have personal power. All right. So how can we get people to understand about personal power? What, what do you think 
we can do. Well, I think, right in the lap, Marshall. <laughs> I, I think we can uh, gather together in groups. Yeah. So that we have each other to lean on. I think. And we can attend these um, very frequent training sessions on, on well, self-expression and personal power and, mm. and, um, and um, so, yeah, just just work at it, work yeah. at it, and, uh, and encourage each other, and and be brave, and and um, yeah, it's like that. I I, I don't think, know, Diane. Yeah, I think you're right. And um, again, let's not write us off. We all have personal power. And one of the things that struck me, and this is kind of a sidebar, but um, you talked about people not wanting to take responsibility. But when you take responsibility, that's when it gets exciting. That's yeah, what right. happen. I mean, it's like the best thing that you could ever do. Right. Exactly right. And I, I, uh, I've certainly had a wonderful run with this climate lobby and, uh, just assuming responsibility for what needs to be done. Yeah. And I hope we'll be successful in getting this legislation passed, I hope. And, um, but it's, but it's been a wonderful run and it has been, uh, because I, uh, I, I just accepted that we needed to, change the the congress change yeah. the way they way they think and of course we still do now, fortunately i mean in in the house apparently we have much younger people we have people who are mm, more concerned about issues i think that's what i'm seeing anyway um and hopefully there are people in the house that will in the Senate, I'm sorry, in the Senate that will begin to um, think about that. And the other piece that, that strikes me too, there comes a point at which your own, one's own personal gain has got to be less important than the gain for all. And when you talked about re-election and stuff, I mean, it's just crazy. It's like, you know, then the issues get buried under, you know, raising money. And it's just, it's a very interesting thing. And it probably doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about right now. But. Well, yeah, well, it does too. Uh, it's, uh, we, we need a, uh, a uh, transformation of social consciousness. Yeah. We, we need do. to, uh, and, and with, where that transformation goes, responsibility, I, I, I say, uh, a transformation of so, social consciousness and, and responsibility. Yeah. And, I think you're so right. That's what, these kids, that. that's what these kids have. I mean, they're like, Greta Thunberg, the 15 year old kid, standing out in the rain outside of the, um, whatever their Congress is, I don't know, I'm sorry. But until she got noticed and then she i see her she's sitting at a table with all these heads of state this little girl <laughs> and you're listening so i think there is a desire in many people to uh, understand what's going on and what we can do about it so i i think that is there but anyway i want to get back to you so what is the national carbon fee and dividend how does it work and people need to understand that me too. I want to understand. Well, basic outline. I don't want to go too deep into the weeds with it, but when carbon comes out of the ground, yeah. a calculation is made by one of the government agencies yeah, to how much carbon dioxide it's going to produce. Yeah. And then a fee is charged for each ton of carbon dioxide that will be emitted and uh, <clears throat> uh, 
we we ask for it we are asking for it and and it is in the legislation uh, that has been introduced that the uh, that the fees start out at fifteen dollars a ton so Peabody coal takes out uh, so much coal out of the ground uh, calculation is made on how how uh, much co2 is going to produce and if, and is multiplied by fifteen fifteen dollars per ton, and uh, it's a uh, not a small amount of money. It's a very large amount of money, and um, um, and then uh, that revenue is distributed to uh, individuals. So it's not kept by the government. Right. So uh, we avoid the growth of government, and we can, and I certainly agree with avoiding the growth of government, and um, and um, the uh, the fee um, goes up ten dollars uh, a ton every year. Ten dollars a ton every year, so uh, people start to make long-term uh, decisions. Like, I mean, if it, it'll it'll cause people to make really millions of decisions about what car they're gonna buy, whether or not they're gonna put insulation in the ceiling of their home. Uh, how does it how does it directly affect what car somebody's going to buy? How does that work? Well, if you, if you can see that uh, oh, all of a sudden uh, the the gasoline has gone up because of the fifteen dollars a, a ton, and um, and it's going to go up again next year, and the gas price is going to go up again the following year. And then you say, well, maybe I should buy a smaller car. Maybe I should buy an electric car. Yeah. Or a hybrid, yeah. So okay. that's the idea to make it comparatively uh, more and more, and more and more and more and more expensive than the electric car. Right. Okay, that, that makes perfect sense. But I also, um, for this newsletter I told you, the Echo newsletter that I'm helping to write, I'm looking at things all over. And there are companies that are now pretty green um, in the way they produce clothing, um, getting rid of plastics, all kinds of things. So do you see those as steps in helping us? Well, yeah, yes, Diane, of course I do. And uh, I mean, it's as obvious, but... But people yeah. have got to get the idea that we've got to stop putting the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. It's, that's Main one is carbon dioxide. But there are many others. Uh, methane, we've got to learn how to educate our, got to educate our farmers on uh, keeping the ground, the uh, land covered. Um, and just and and then all the refrigerants. Some of these refrigerants are extremely efficient, if that's the right word, at trapping greenhouse gases. We've got to stop putting gas in in the atmosphere. Right. So no matter what we do, uh, otherwise, it's just uh, we're we're not going to solve the problem. You know, it's like uh, it's like. Uh, like Peck was talking about, we got to face reality. People avoid what needs to be done. What needs to be done is we need to get carbon dioxide. We need to stop putting it in the atmosphere. Bottom line. First, first step. And then if we don't do that, then it's all just this and that. Thank you for making that so clear. I mean, I, I kind of know it, but I didn't, it didn't really sink in. Yeah unless the way you're telling me about it. Yeah, thank you. No, you got it. <laughs> the other thing that I, I noticed, a lot of um, third world countries and some European countries are planting 
tons of trees, like acres and acres and acres of trees in order to absorb um, the carbon dioxide and to cool the planet down. Do you see that as a deterrent at all? Well, sure, you know, sure. But the bottom line is if we don't stop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. People I, don't want to do it. And, you know, you know, Diane, the biggest problem, people ask me what the biggest problem is, and I think it's us. human nature. Human Thanks. nature. Our refusal to face reality. Yeah. Yeah. And which is a form of laziness. Yeah. Which I say and Peck says is a form of fear. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, it, as I'm going through things in my mind that I know about that are changing, that, yeah, if we don't come down to that, yeah. Um, it's just it, it's just phenomenal to me that people who are reasonably educated um, don't get it. But I but I understand what you're saying. Very very well educated. Some of, you know I've got a few few friends left and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, they. Uh, first of all, if they ever get the idea that, yeah, there really is climate change going on and it's serious, uh, you know, then that's it. Yeah. Oh, I got it. Yeah. But as far as picking up the phone, getting in the car and going seeing their member of Congress, uh, uh, you know, just they just don't do it. Yeah. With this election coming up, though, um, uh, most of the candidates are talking about climate change. I mean, I, I think they get it. So there is hope there. Yeah. Really Jay Inslee, I just got a letter from uh, Jay Inslee. I, I sent him uh, a little money. And um, I'm, I'm hopeful that he's going to keep climate change in the forefront. It's going to be tough. Yeah. And because the other candidates are, don't, again, don't mind mentioning it and saying they're for legislation, but as far as digging in and uh, and uh, changing the rules, they don't they don't talk about it. Yeah, there's there was a cartoon on Facebook that circulated for a while, and it said, "If you can't breathe, counting your money won't matter." <laughs> that's, that's right. Like it. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and so. James uh, Anderson, professor at Harvard, um, has said that our window has changed. It's no longer a ten-year window; it's a five-year window. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it's at least that short. Yeah. And you know, there's sometimes when I think, "Holy socks!" You know, just and 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 we have to change. Um, you know, and I'm seeing at the same time um, this uh, reluctance in Congress. We've got uh, one Republican on that bill. We've got 40 co-sponsors. So we've got one Republican on that bill. And um, what's that? Uh, what is that uh, lethargy and uh, avoidance? You know, just again, I just go back to to uh, to Scotty Peck and human nature, yeah. and then and we've got to excuse me, we've got to uh, do this not just in the United States. We 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 have our focus on on the United States. I think we should, uh, but uh, this has got to occur all over the world. Sure. You know, Russia. I just uh, it's hard for me to see them giving up their selling oil to uh, the rest of the world. Yeah. And, and then it comes down to this idea of uh, selfishness and selflessness. Yeah. So we all need this personal transformation from selfishness to selflessness. Yeah. And it's, um, it's not... Um, 
like automatic. It's not just like what we do as human beings. We want to count our money until we can't breathe. The thing that strikes me too is that when we are selfless, it connects all of us up. When we are selfish, it isolates us. So in a way, it's in our best interest to be selfless because then we're not alone. Then we have lots of support and a lot of help. But when we become selfish, then lots of times we're alone fighting, you know, whatever we're fighting. So it's it's just really, really interesting. Um, One, can I read a couple of things from the website? There were some things that, um, well, most of the website for uh, Citizens Climate Lobby was amazing. And there were things that just struck me. And if I can read a couple of them. Sure, of course. So here it is. And I quote, we believe that people are good and that democracy works. We're confident that our approach will work because we see progress. We stand for a solution, not in protest of other solutions. We don't expect perfection from ourselves or others. This is a process. And we know that people can improve. Together we are a community that offers one another comfort, support, and fun as we work. (laughs) Isn't it wonderful? And here's the second one, I love this. We listen, we work to find common values, and we endeavor to understand our own biases. We are honest and firm. We know that there is a place for protest, but our approach is to build consensus, and that's what will bring enduring change. That was phenomenal. Whoever wrote that, did you write that? It's, it's- <laughs> no, I want to. I want to tell you who did. First of all, uh, that's to me. That's a description of uh, transformation, and uh, it's not only for individuals, but as an organization. Yeah. There was a uh, a, uh, a young lady up in the Bay Area who joined. As a citizen, as a partner, just like you have, right. and uh, she was, um, you know, just a regular partner. I had, I don't think I'd ever heard of her, and um, and she called Mark Reynolds, the executive director, and she said, "I see these values that you ha- that you have, the organization has. Would you mind?" If I interviewed your partners and interview your staff and interview you and Mark, Mark, Mark and Marshall, and uh, and try to write out what these values are, well, we hadn't thought about it. Yeah. You know, we Mark and I come from similar backgrounds, and um, and we've had some similar training. Matter of fact, I used to take classes from Mark, and so. Uh, we, t- we told her, her name is Leslie Beatty, said, yeah, go ahead. And so she started the uh, interview. She called here and we talked for a while. Yeah. And then she wrote out these six values. There are now seven, but she wrote them out. And we thought, yeah, that's it. But it didn't come from the board of directors or the executive director or the founder or anybody like that. It came from her. Grassroots. Grassroots. Grassroots, she came from, to that. came from the grassroots, and um, and uh, we just loved it. We just loved those values, and um, it's so. perfect. It's perfect. She can write. If you see her, please give her my kudos too. It's okay, a- I will. I, you know, I talk to her once in a while, and uh, we have staff calls. Yes, and so I'll, I'll mention it. Yeah. Every sentence, I wanted to read every sentence, and I thought, well, we can't really do that. But everything <laughs> wrote was so wonderful. And it's yeah. filled with hope. And yeah. it's filled with, with strength. Yeah. Well, she's a, she's a well-educated uh, young woman. And, um, and uh, yeah, she said it all pretty well. Oh, it's wonderful. It's so wonderful. And it also um, kind of lets us know the quality of the group, the quality of the Citizens Climate Lobby. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, from the beginning, we always wanted it to be transformational. Yeah. You know, we, we didn't certainly didn't write out those values, but we want, wanted it to be transformational. 
And uh, how else can I say that? I don't know how else I can say that we wanted people to, to uh, okay, I don't know. I'm running out, running out of words here. You wanted people to wake up. You wanted to be <laughs> a focus yeah. and a locus, yeah. both of those things. Yeah, yeah Diane, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, earlier in life, my way of waking people up was to, to get mad or angry at them or make them wrong, make yeah. people wrong, but they don't respond very well. Like they respond poorly. And so I think part of uh, the success of the organization, though, I guess is a little braggadocious, was that work I had done to stop making people wrong and to uh and and part of that is loving loving people and uh and sometimes that's work for me it's work for everybody <laughs> it's work that's for true. me I, I wish i was just naturally uh loving and sweet but uh you know unfortunately <laughs> i uh yeah as i write i kind of discover and, and the things that I'm discovering is that we all feel like we're right. And we all feel like we have to make everybody else understand that we're right. And yeah. they have to join us. And um, it's something that kind of has grown. I think that's what we're seeing in our culture. That all of a sudden, instead of minding our own business, we're minding everybody else's business. And we just don't notice how we function. We don't notice what we're doing. We don't notice what we think. We're so focused on everybody else. And that's, that's one of the things I think that um, maturity changes. Um, but I, I see that a lot. So I guess what you're doing to communicate with people in a peaceful way, um, it doesn't put their back up and it doesn't make them dig into their position. It allows them to shift. Yeah. 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 And, uh, attendant with, um, of, of, um, it is, um, possibility that you're going to lose if you can't force people to do things. You know, then you have to be willing to lose. And the, the thing itself has to be so important that it doesn't matter. I mean, it's like, if this is our last hurrah, this is how we have to go down. You know, we have to go down saying what we know is true and doing what we know is the right thing to do at the moment. Right. Exactly right. Yes. Yeah. But I, I think that's how... Um, that's how life really is. It's like once you find, and I, again, I think it, I was going to say it's a maturity thing, but look at these kids. I mean, they're like old beyond their years. They're powerful beyond their years. Yeah, um, right. But they're yeah. so, and, and remember, if we have a five year window, these kids are going to be five years older and they will be voting and they will be um, lobbying and they will be marching and they will be speaking. And so, uh, a lot of it, I think, will come from them, too. But I think you've made it really clear to me in a way that I hadn't understood before um, that with Congress, they're so concerned about getting elected and keeping a lifestyle, if I can extrapolate it out to that, um, that they're not paying attention. And I think in... If these kids are in, in these states and they can get to their um, elected officials and saying, you know, we're going to vote next year and this is how we're going to vote. So, you know, I think that that's one of the things that has to happen in some way. What do you think? <laughs> well, of course. Yeah. Of course. I, I, uh, yeah, new, new voters. Got to get them to vote in the, for the right senators. It's, yeah. And we need it. Uh, we need uh, American leadership. And that's the other thing that's been missing. We've had no leader. All right. It's been uh, <laughs> a leader going the wrong way. Yes. And 
I don't know. I do know that we're doing, maybe it sounds arrogant, we're doing the right thing. Yes. And, um, and, and, and very important is we're doing it the right way. Yes. Are, are you with me on that? Absolutely. Yes. We, we go violent, we go make wrong, we do all of that stuff. There we're, we're losing ground. Yep. So uh, we're, we're doing the right, one of the, one of the uh, Eastern uh, uh, religions it says something like this is the Lord t uh, t talking to every, every person. Your job, I guess, is to select a worthy goal. Give it all you have. Um, go about it the right way. Uh, and the results are up to somebody else. Mm. So, I love that. Yeah, I do too. It it uh, gives a certain amount of uh, detachment to what we're doing, and uh, and again, what there is to do is the right thing in the right way, and. Uh, and then we're not responsible for what happens. Right. But you know, you gave it your best shot and that you did what was in your heart and what you knew to be right. And that sense of right doesn't come from the ego of, you know, I'm right, you're wrong. It comes from that deep in your heart. You can feel that this okay. is what needs to happen. It's yeah. a very different kind of energy in that. And I think, right. One of the things that um, you talk so strongly about is so important that when you don't attack people, when you don't make them wrong, then they have room to maneuver. Yeah. Once you corner somebody, you're done. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. Nobody ever changed their mind after losing an argument. <laughs> There was a senator here, and I, I can't remember his name, and he, he just died, and he's very um, important in our history here. He's been around for many, many years. And what he talked about was the way that they used to do politics. And what they would do is they would get together all of the um, people and the councils and so forth. They would get together, and they would have dinner together. No jackets, no ties. And, and then it was all men, obviously. Um, yeah. And that's how they would get things done. And they would talk. And, yeah. and I think, and that's kind of what you're doing. And I think that's what we need to do. We just need to sit down and talk and not push somebody in a, into a position, but say, you know, this is what I'm thinking. And this is why, what do you think? And how does that fit with, you know, that kind of discussion? So that's kind of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I remember reading a little snippet about uh, Lyndon Johnson and Sam Rayburn and yeah. you know, three or four of their cohorts uh, having these uh, dinners after a long work day and, and sometimes uh, just having a, a bourbon. Yeah. I get together in uh, Lyndon Johnson's office or Sam Rayburn's office and having a bourbon and yeah. So, yeah, so we, need, we need more of that. We need that. We absolutely do. People just need yeah. to start talking to one another, not in rallies or groups, but, you know, a handful of individuals. I think that's kind of, oh. that, that sounds good to me. That sounds like something that works. So yes. tell me the things that you think are working, please. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me just let me just think for a second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, first of all, we have a bill introduced. Okay. Diana, it took us ten years. We had an idea, carbon fee, and dividend, and uh, and we worked on that from uh, uh, January. First of that was January of uh, 09. Mm -hmm. And so here we are into uh, well into 19. 
Yeah. So that we have a bill introduced is uh, is really big. <clears throat> that we have uh, this idea of people gathering together in groups uh, all over the country. Well, all over the many places in the world. I think we're 51 countries now. Wow, fabulous. Yeah, that was the idea of, um, of uh, citizens um, empowerment and citizens uh, working with and lobbying and trying to guide our, uh, their members of Congress from different parts of the world. Uh, that's, that's working. I think the, uh, the idea of marrying uh, transformation with uh, the work that needs to be done in climate change is, is working. It's a good idea. And, uh, and um, well, the word that's coming to the mind is love, but we, uh, but ultimately, if we're going to get anything done, we're going to have to love each other. Yeah. And, uh, of course, that takes patience and, and work. <laughs> I think, uh, going back to Peck for a second, he said that uh, love is work and courage. Is that what he said? I can't remember. Work and courage. Yeah. But it's true. And um, I, I feel a little bit that you sound discouraged sometimes but in our conversation. But what I want to say to you is what you've done for me today, what you've done for our listeners today is phenomenal. And uh, it's like, it's the spark. You touch a spark. It's like boom, 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 everywhere. And yeah. that, that in itself is amazing. And the fact that you have 51 chapters or more um, with people talking about this and they will, people will do something. Once they get it, they will start doing things. So I, I hope that you get the feedback so you see this work in progress really working. Well, um, thanks. That would be well, for you. Um, yeah, the so chapters are like 500 and so 500. in, the, oh in the United States. Yeah, and then and then chapters in 51 countries. Ah, sorry, my my correction. Thank yeah. you. That. That's yeah. a lot of people talking. A lot of people talking. A lot of a lot of meetings with members of Congress. A lot of meetings with uh, newspapers and television stations. We need more work on television stations, but. Okay. But uh, yeah, we're we're doing that too, and and uh, meeting with uh, uh, board board of directors of big and important companies, and then uh, I'm just thinking of uh, going down meeting with the editorial board of the San Diego Union. Wow. Great. Which we've done that many, you know, not many, but several, several times. And then when the bill came out, they put they put that an endorsement on their editorial page. Wow! Uh, within 15 hours, the bill came out on, you know, one afternoon. Next morning, wow! They had an endorsement. And we've met with them, you know, many, many times, explained it, explained it to them, and, and uh, bang, and then they found themselves in the lead. This is wonderful. It is wonderful. And you're to be congratulated for hanging in there. I mean, you've chosen a really um, arduous path. <laughs> and you've hung in there, and you, you're doing it. You're doing it. And that's, that's um, an inspiration for people to take something that's really hard to commit to it and not back down and <laughs> it starts coming together. And I really feel that it is coming together. I'm, I'm starting to see it more and more. So um, I w I'm going to stay in touch with you if I might. And yeah. email you every once in a while on things that I see that are changing. So... Uh, yeah. Just to to give you some more attaboys, if we will. So, <laughs> Marshall, thank you. This has been um, 
eye-opening in lots of ways, and you put things together for me in a way that I hadn't seen before. And, and I've, pretty, I've been exploring this for a while, but the way you did it, and I mean, the bottom line is you can't put any more carbon in the air. And that's the bottom line. And that will now be my mantra as I'm, as I'm talking to people and, and um, joining groups and so forth. So thank you. I can't thank you enough for what you're doing. I, it is noble, as necessary. Um, you're one of the few that's decided to do that. And I think that these kids that we talked about a little bit before are going to be um, showing up in ways that we hadn't even thought about, and they will help bring this forward. So, Marshall, thank you again. I, I so admire and um, am delighted that you took the time to be with us. So, thank you. And I will have um, your website and um, how to join the chapters up on the um, when this is posted, and I will send you a copy. Okay, Diane. Thank you. It's a real honor to be with you and uh, with people who watch the blog and it's just a real honor and privilege and I've been excited about it. So here we are. Thank you, Marshall. I will okay. be talking with you, I'm sure. Take care. All right. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, and my listeners, thank you so much for joining with us and I hope you will start looking at the Citizens Climate Lobby in your area, and you can join it and um, talk with like-minded people, um, begin to get more information and understand more what's going on and how you can contribute, because we all can help. So we don't need to be upset about it. We just need to dig in and do it. So thank you for joining us on Transformations, Interviewing People, Changing Our World. I'm your host, Diane J. Shaver, and I want one day to be interviewing you because you've done what's in your heart to make this a better, just, healthier, more equitable world. So I will ask you to, if you want to, go to our YouTube channel, and it's Diane Shaver, D-I-A-N-N-E-S-H-A-V-E-R, all in caps. And you can listen to interviews with people who are changing our world. And one day you'll be there. So I will talk with you later and I will see you next time.